down a bit. I wanted to look at carry on looking at Jesus because I think that's our uh, critical point, isn't it? He's the crucial thing. He's the thing that brings us all together. Not how we do things. It's not the worship. Uh, it's not this building. It's not where we live. It's Jesus that brings us together. So um, I was looking at, wondering what to do, and I, 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 well, God sort of pointed me towards the Gospel of Mark. So I'm going to start working through the Gospel of Mark. We'll see how it goes. It might not be thorough. We might just skip from one bit to another. But we want to see what Jesus did. I want to see who the real Jesus is. And so this focus in Mark is on what Jesus did. So that's what we're going to look at. Uh, so we're going to start looking at and, and Mark, let me give you some context for the, 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 the gospel of Mark. It's the shortest gospel, uh, but it was the first one that was written. It's thought to be written around AD 55, six, between AD 55 and 65, around that sort of thing. And because initially, and this is, this is only 20, 30 years after Jesus had passed away, that Jesus had been killed. Because they'd passed it around orally up to that point. They'd, they'd preached, they'd, the, the apostles had taught, the disciples were there. There was many eyewitnesses around to say what Jesus had done. And at this point, they start to mean they need to write it down. Now, if you think about those dates, if we said it was 20 years, if we said it was 55 or something like that, it's about 20 years. That is like someone writing when we started this church. When we started this church. That's the sort of concept you think, well, I can remember quite a lot that happened 20 years ago. And I'm sure there's many people that are still alive that have been through church, been with us, can tell us, can say, oh yes, I remember that happening. And we'll have eyewitness accounts. So the Gospels had these eyewitness people saying, yeah, I was there, I remember. So they couldn't spread a Gospel so, you know, they wouldn't say, well, you know, um, Jesus, yeah, we used to fly from one place to another and he'd appear and then he'd disappear and then reappear somewhere else. They'd say, oh, don't give us that nonsense. He didn't. He, he was like us. He lived like a man, although he was God. So we, we have this, and, and he, that, that's the context we've got to see as Mark is writing this gospel. There were many disciples. And actually, this, 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 is, you know, this was written down not only for the benefit of disciples then, but the, dis, the benefit of disciples now. That 2,000 years later, we can still find the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus here. Let me give you a little bit more context. The author of this book as it, you know, it's the Gospel of Mark, and it's pretty much accepted by most people. This is John Mark, who was uh, Simon Peter's, seems to be Simon Peter's assistant and translator. And we know who Simon Peter is one of the, the, uh, the apostles, and we'll see his calling just as we go through this passage that Jesus calls him to be a disciple. But let's just head on for Mark at the moment. What, who's this Mark and why, why is he able to write this gospel? Well, he, he knew Peter and it's, what we're seeing is Peter's story. If you, as we go through Mark and as we pick up different parts of this gospel, you see that it, most of the things happen because Peter is there. So Peter is recounting his eyewitness account of Jesus so Mark doesn't bother with the, with the nativity. He doesn't bother with genealogies. He doesn't bother with setting a big scene. He's straight at it. And he comes in when Jesus gets baptised. So we'll see that as it comes. But back to John. Anyway, uh, no, sorry, John, John Mark. So this is, let me just give you some con Mark 15, 52 is, it says there's a young man following Jesus as, he's, as he gets arrested. And he's just wearing a loincloth and he gets caught and he runs, leaves the loincloth behind. That's John. He's there. He's there when Jesus is arrested. He's, in, he's involved. He doesn't say it's him, 
and he's very modest. But he's also mentioned in Acts 12, verse 12, it's his mother's house where they're praying for Peter while he's in prison. You know, and, and the, uh, the servant girl goes to door Rhoda. So we assume that John Mark's mother, and if she was, if she was owning the house, if it, was, it was a lady called Mary, it's not one of the other Marys um, that were at, at Jesus' um, burial. But, but actually, um, she was obviously quite a wealthy woman. Had this servant girl called Rhoda, and, and Peter comes to the door and she says, oh, uh, uh, yeah, we're praying for him. It must be his ghost. Peter's at the door. Peter's at the door! This is John Mark's mum. This is John Mark's house. That's where they're gathering to pray. He's critical in, in this time of Jesus. But he was a young man. A young man. And then eventually John Mark is the, is the companion of Paul and Barnabas as they start on their mission to spread the gospel. They, they go with Paul and Barnabas. And then Paul and Barnabas fall out over John Mark because John Mark goes back at one point. But later, he is reunited with Paul and Paul says, bring John Mark because he is useful to my ministry. So that's John Mark. That's all we're going to say about him. The focus of this gospel is on what Jesus did. Mainly on what Jesus did. Mainly what Jesus did, I mean. I'm saying that wrong, and not really what he taught. There is some teaching in this. We've got some sections about parables and teaching, but it's in the present tense and it's very fast paced. It's very quick. That you know, um, we have eight or nine verses at the start here that we're going to read in a moment. Luke uses seventy three to do the same passage, the same account. So we've got a lot more detail in Luke. But what we're getting here is Mark just wants to tell you, this is what Peter said. This is what Peter saw. This is how it felt. So we get extra detail. It's always, everything's imme- immediately Jesus did this. And we get this sort, of, this sort of detail. Anyway, so let's read the passage before I waffle on any longer. Okay, do you want to stand and read? I'll just give you a moment to stand. You want to, are you feeling cold? Stand up now. Let's stand. And then I'm going to read the gospel. Do this in, in, the, um, in the Anglican church. When they read the gospel, they all stand up. So let's stand up. Just an idea to keep you warm if you're cold. You don't have to. Don't. Just if you're feeling cold, you want to stretch your legs. So verse 1 of Mark chapter 1. In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, sorry. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to John. The Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet... Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all who, all of the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a red leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you, I am well pleased. The Spirit spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen. If you'd like to sit. 
Fantastic. So I'm going to really cover up to the baptism of Jesus today. I'm going to look at the temptation of Jesus another day because there's a lot more to be said uh, in there. So, but I wanted to get the context of the wilderness so that my title for this morning is The Real Jesus Beginning in the Wilderness. Beginning in the Wilderness. And there's two main points I'm going to make. Firstly, uh, preparing the way. And then secondly, beginning in the wilderness. So we'll look at those two things. So firstly, preparing the way. These first eight chapters of this gospel are really declaring Jesus' identity, declaring who he is, declaring his authority, his authority over sickness, his authority over evil, his authority over food. We see the feeding of the 5,000 here. Uh, and and a, a authority over people, authority over the natural world as he... As he uh, as he calms the storm and the waves. And then the second half of the Gospel of Mark really sort of points towards his journey to the cross. He starts to share that he's come to die. He starts to share his reason for coming. It's, a, a, it's described in, in some commentaries as the testing in suffering. Even though Jesus has the authority and he is Lord over all these things. He submits to the Father's will and he dies for the human race because of our sin. But he is the Messiah and defeats sin and death. So John the Baptist is the one who's declaring, he's, he's the one that it is, it prepares the way. Preparing people's hearts convicting them of their sin and reminding them of God's promises. So we see this, and so we, firstly he comes back and he, um, they declare these two verses, said, uh, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Now any, any of you who are, are clever among us and are Bible students will know that some of this isn't from Isaiah. Ah, shock, horror. The first bit that he says is actually from Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 but Isaiah also has that sense in it and Isaiah is the major prophet so Isaiah gets the the mention I suppose you know he gets the quote uh, rather than uh, Malachi that's what the commentators think and that's the way they would the Jews would declare things so let me just read these these two verses to you Malachi 3 verse 1 says behold I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So that's Malachi 3. And then Isaiah 40, verse 3, which would be familiar. And obviously Isaiah, he was the guy. He says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. In the wilderness, in the wilderness, prepare a way for God. In the wilderness, prepare a way. There's no palace, there's no throne. It's the wilderness that God comes to meet us. It's the wilderness that John came to. It's the wilderness that Jesus comes to. That's where our preparation with God will happen. In the times of wilderness. And we'll come back to that in a minute. John preached that the Messiah was coming. One who would baptize, not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. John says, I'm not even worthy to be a servant of his, to untie his sandals. I'm not worthy even to be a servant of the one who's coming. Never mind being asked if I'm him.
But how easily can we put ourselves in what we want Jesus to be? How we can declare that, you know, um, we can put our, our image of Jesus forward. This is what we think Jesus is like. This is what we want. This is how we want to package Jesus. This is the image we want people to see. We want Jesus, you know, we, we love that image of Jesus coming, you know, coming in and being, you know, celebrated as he comes into Jerusalem. But he starts his ministry in the wilderness. It's in the wilderness that we are prepared. It's in the wilderness we have to trust in God. But we'll come back to that in a minute. Why did John say that Jesus would baptize in the Spirit? And actually, uh, I think the other, common, uh, the other gospel sometimes have baptized you in water. And I, he will baptize you in fire. And it's this sense, are they are reading back into something they've seen? But I think it's, it's that sense of, it's the, the, the context is the difference. The difference between those two things. Yes, it's true. But whether they, do they know, does John know that? Presume he knows that from prophet, promises and prophecies in the Old Testament. But it's a context that Jesus isn't just going to wash us clean. He's actually going to be the one who is clean. He's going to stand in our place. He's the one who is clean that we trust in. No amount of washing, no baptism, no water is going to forgive us. Only his sacrifice, only his death, the power in his death is what saves us. Jesus wasn't just another prophet. He was the fulfillment of the prophet, of the prophecy, of all the prophecies. Jesus comes as the fulfillment and the, the way has been prepared. John, the Baptist, he's just following the call of God on his life. But he's completely focused it's a bit of a loony, isn't he? He met a guy in camel hair, eating locusts. You know, dip, he probably dipped. You can imagine that he dipped the locusts in the honey because I can't imagine that eating locusts is very tasty. You know, and people are going out to see this guy. You think, really? We go out and see this guy? In the, in the wilderness where there isn't any shops? No, it's by the, I mean, this is by the river. But, but he, you know, he's wearing camel hair and he's eating locusts. What's he got to say to us? We can't look at those images. We have to look at what the calling is. And sometimes we find that people and the message, it's, it's the person that offends us. Not, and we miss the message because we're offended by the person. It's not, our, it's not in our image of what we think the, the great prophet should be like or the one who's preparing the way. You think, you know, we can imagine someone ripping up the ground and marching ahead and making their way past. I'm going to make, I'm going to bosh through here. I'm going to take all these people. Oh, that's funny. It sounds different up here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here. I'm going to bash through here to make this way straight so Jesus can follow me. No, he's in the wilderness. He's preaching a, a message of forgiveness. He's preaching a message of repentance. Repent of your sins because the king is coming. This is the way that we prepare. You know, if the king was coming here, what would we do? We'd make a way, wouldn't we? We'd be outside. We'd be brushing every leaf, polishing every stone, cleaning up, hoovering. We'd, be, we'd clean every chair. Now, Chantal's doing a good job. But every single chair, we'd make it pristine. We would prepare the way so we didn't, we'd be painting. You know, that's what the, the Queen used to say, that my, my, you know, her overriding memory of visiting places was the smell of new paint. 
Because everyone, you know, when the queen was coming, everyone paid, well, prepare, the queen's coming. She ain't bothered. She ain't bothered what your paint works like. She wasn't, she wasn't. You know, I can't even imagine her coming up to the end and saying, well, I'm not going there again. I really don't like what they've done with the place. I haven't even painted. It's outrageous. And I'm the queen. Jesus wants to prepare. We, want, we need to prepare our hearts for this king. We need to prepare a way for him to come. And actually, this, this wilderness is critical in this. And if we just look back at John, John has a very limited part in this, doesn't he? You know, John says, I need to become less and he needs to become more. How much are we like, oh, well, I need to be more and he needs to be less. I need, you know, I, I, need, I need success. I need to develop. I need, I, know, I need more preaching opportunities. I need to be uh, further forward. You know, if you're, you're sitting near the front, you're, you're obviously more committed to the... So there's not three people. Um, success is here, okay, in the f- front two rows. That's what people sat in the old days. They sat in the, If you had a seat near the front, you were the ones paying the bills. May still be the truth. But actually, what are we looking for? The place where God prepares us. We are just like John. We are a limited part in God's larger plan. We're just a limited. I mean, I I think it was Andy last week said, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. Well, then you think about us. Well, if the nations are a drop in a bucket, what are we? We're not even a drop in the bucket. And yet, and yet, God chooses to use us to prepare the way for others to come to him. Are you preparing the way? Are you playing your part? Are you like John the Baptist? Are you declaring what God has given you? Are you trusting him in all times? How are we preparing the way? It's my que- question. How are you preparing the way for others to come to the king? Okay, secondly... It's beginning in the wilderness. And we, as, we've, as we've looked at John, John was a man of the wilderness, wasn't he? We, we see that in his thing. He's, he's out of the city. He's out of civilization. He's, he's surviving in the wild. Now, we, we can think of wilderness and we think, oh, I'm going off into the woods, you know, and I'll survive here. But you're like, you know, half a mile from, you know, the, the local shop and there's a, there's a flushable toilet just round the corner and I need a shower and, you know, even wild camping is not really that wild, is it? Um, you know, we, 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 we don't, but actually the, the, the word for wilderness here is really desert. And I'll, 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 we'll, I'll explain that in a moment. But the desert, there's nothing. In the wilderness, you're completely reliant on God. There's no water. There's no food. There's no protection. You're reliant on God to provide for you, to keep you alive. That's where we begin. We could begin in a place where we haven't got anything left in ourselves, where we're not. You know, I, well, I'll come to God when I've got everything sorted. I'll come to God when, he, you know, I, as long as I get this job, as I'll, I'll go to church as long as I can, I can pay my way. I'll go to church uh, with, uh, as long as he, I get healed. We, go, we make all these conditions for how we're going to come to God. And actually, he wants us in the wilderness. He wants us eager He wants us trusting in him completely in all our life. Not just on a Sunday. We've we've put the the box away now, but in the Christmas decorator, we've got the nativity. And in the the nativity, we have Jesus in a 
in, in, the, in the manger. And we only get him out for a, a month a year. And the rest of the year, we keep him in a box in the cellar. But it's that how you treat Jesus in your life. You just get him out. Get him out for the special occasions. Get him out when you need him. Keep him in a box. Bit of shame. We keep things in the cellar that we know we need, but we don't want anyone else to see. I've got a loft full of stuff. I haven't got a cellar. I've got a loft full of stuff that I, I think I need. Probably don't. But I don't want to get rid of it because it might come handy one day. Like all my accountancy notes, all Nikki's social work notes. Christmas decorations are obviously up there. Computers. I've got so many computers in the loft because I don't know what to do with them. When you stop using them, you think, there's too much information on here. I'll just put it in the loft. I might need it one day. Our relationship with Jesus can't be like that. It can't be where we're keeping him stored away. We're keeping him in the loft or we're keeping him in his top pocket and we get him out when we need him. No, it's about a relationship. It's reliance on him because you're in a wilderness and you can't survive without him. You need his water. You need his food. You need his purpose in your life to fulfill your self. Fulfillment doesn't come by looking for fulfillment. Fulfillment comes by completing your purpose in God. If we're looking for fulfillment, we're not going to find it. If you're looking for fulfillment in church life, you're not going to find it. If you're looking for fulfillment in family, in career, in houses, if you're looking for your fulfillment in those things, you will not find them. You will only find fulfillment when you find your purpose in God. When you know what he's called you for. And you know what? Like John the Baptist, it'll be quite limited. We... I'd like to declare, I, you, we're not the Messiah. People think I am. People ask me questions, say, yeah, but you're the leader. I said, I'm not the Messiah. I can't change people's hearts. Only God can do that. Just from just a very naughty boy, really. Naughty sheep, naughty sheep. Okay, where are we? Gone off on a bit of a tangent there, haven't I? Let's get back to my notes. It's really unhelpful, this, because it's printed. My printer's not working. And it's printed some of it upside down because it's done it double-sided. So I've probably missed out a big chunk of what I was going to say because it's upside down. It's not very helpful. So is that why... No, I was going to say, where am I? It's a good job there's page numbers, isn't there? I've missed some really good stuff, okay? You've missed some really good stuff, we'll put it in a blog. <laughs> Let's talk about the gospel. That's what I've missed. It's bad, isn't it? The beginning of the gospel, if John doesn't say this gospel word is so critical. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is, this is how Mark begins. We're in the desert, but it, this is how it begins. This word gospel is not just, it's, it's, we translate it as good news. And we use it in different terms. Don't we would say, oh, did they preach the gospel this morning? And with the message of Jesus, did, did, did we read, or don't read from the gospels of Mark and Matthew and Luke and John? But actually, when this word was originally used, it was really more about a significant event was being declared. So that, you know, it was the birth of a new king. This was groundbreaking news. Groundbreaking. It wasn't just, oh, well, that's good news. You know, well, that's nice. Jesus died on the cross. Well, that's nice. Jesus came. Well, that's nice. That's what people say, don't they? Well, that's nice for you. That's nice for you. No, this is groundbreaking. The gospel is groundbreaking. It challenges us down to our feet, throughout us. It's everything. It's not just nice. 
it's much more important. It's what John Piper says. The gospel is good news because it brings a person into the everlasting and ever-increasing joy of Jesus Christ. He is not merely the rope that pulls us from the threatening waves. He is the solid beach under our feet and the air in our lungs and the beat of our hearts and the warm sun on our skin and the song in our ears and the arms of our beloved. So the gospel, so Jesus, he is the gospel. He is that, and we can only find that in the wilderness, in the desert place, in the place where we're completely reliant, where there is no water. He is the anointed one. If we think about this thing about wilderness, I found where I am now. It, it comes through the Old Testament, doesn't it? It doesn't just start with John the Baptist. So who, who else? Do you need, does anyone need to stand up and move about? Anyone stand by the heater with Graham? <laughs> if you need to stand up, be, feel free. But yeah, blankets. We are going to issue blankets. Um... Let's think, just think, if you think back, Moses, where did Moses find the burning bush? That was in the desert, wasn't it? It was in the wilderness. He was out on his own. He was out in the middle of nowhere. What about Jacob? When he wrestles with God, he's out in the wilderness. He's out on his own, declares a place, doesn't he? And then finally, if we think about Israel, where does Israel meet with God? Do they meet with God in Egypt with the cucumbers and the garlic? No, they don't do that. They meet with God at Sinai, which is in the middle of the desert. And they wander around the wilderness for 40 years. And they have to rely on God for their food, for their water. You know, it brings in manna to feed them, brings in uh, quail for them to eat, a bit of meat and, and water. Moses touches the rock and water comes out. It says that the their soles of their shoes didn't wear out. Obviously made by Dr. Martins. Um, is everything else I wear wears out. You know, they, they, they were fully dependent on God. That is where you find God. When you're fully dependent on him. Why did people go and go to John the Baptist. What was, what was this mad bloke in the desert offering? He was offering access to good news. He was reminding them of prophecy, as we've heard. He was reminding them that God has a plan. Now, although it's been so many years since the last Old Testament writing. God is still working his plan. And you might feel like that. You might feel in a place of desert where God isn't speaking, where he's not doing what you want him to do. He's not fixing the relationship or healing you or sorting out that job or sorting out the people around you, whatever it is. And you think, well, you know, where's God? Well, that's, you know, he, he wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him in those dry places. I can feel very dry. It's hard work sometimes, you know, hearing what God wants to say. Sometimes, you know, I find that I, I can, I can I, everything I pick up, God speaks. It's funny, I've found when we pray, God reminds me of all my admin. I don't know if, that, if it's God. But it's like, oh, I need to do that, and I need to do that. It's funny, isn't it? I don't know. I don't know how that works. It reminds me of my admin. So having a notebook when you pray is really handy, and then you can just jot it down and carry on praying. But it's in those, those, those moments where we're trusting God, relying on him, so why did John baptize? 
Why did he baptize? And I think the Jews had practiced ritual washing. Well, I mean, it was good sanitation, good for health as they go into the wilderness. That's where it started. But also it was to do with purity. In Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah, very early on in, in Isaiah, it says, wash yourselves. This is Dave's version. Wash yourselves to remove your sins. Remove yourself. Wash yourself. So they washed to try and remove their sins. But actually it was only Jesus that could wash them. So it's calling them to repentance, not only Gentiles, but Jews to come, wash, repent of your sins, turn away. And what's this word repentance mean? It means to turn around. It doesn't mean just saying sorry. It means changing your mindset, changing how you think. There's a change that comes with repentance. A change of attitude. Change of heart. Living as God's people, doing his well. So finally, why does Jesus go to the wilderness to be baptized by John? And I was going to talk about the temptation as well but we'll look at that next time I speak why is, why, is, why, does, why is Jesus willing to submit himself to John's baptism and to temptation of the devil why is he submitting himself to those things I don't know why he doesn't need to does he he doesn't need to do that. Jesus doesn't need to be baptized by John because he, was, he hadn't sinned. He hadn't sinned. He was perfect. He didn't sin. He never sinned. So why does he need to be baptized? And it, again, it's, it's messages for, for us. It's messages for the, the Jews. This is what the the uh, authorised version says, and it gives us this link with the Old Testament. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee. It's great, isn't it? You can see that opening of, it's like, duh, duh, duh. and the heavens were torn open and the, and the spirit descended at like a dove upon it. You know, it's, it's got that really dramatic sense, is not it? Sorry, I'm giving Daniela a wash, I think to get my teeth done again as he's coming out the water the heavens it says are torn open this is and it's very you know Old Testament biblical language now John doesn't uh, Mark doesn't really give us any help at all you know he doesn't tell us anything really does he in those days Jesus came from Nazareth was baptised by John in the Jordan doesn't tell us why doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us. Matthew gives us a little bit more. This is what Matthew 3 verse 14 says. John asked the question. He says, why do you need to be baptised me? I need to be baptised by you. John recognised who he was. And Jesus answered, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfil all righteousness. Jesus was obedient he was obedient to God the Father. It's what God required him to do. And then it says John consented. Jesus shows us the way. He shows us the way of obedience. He shows us the way of submission to God's way in our life. He shows us the way to God's will. He, you know, in the garden we see later, he says, you know, not my will but yours. I don't want to go through this but what, not my will, but yours. And I'm sure there's things in our lives that we don't want to go through. And she says, and we have to say, not my will. This is what you've laid ahead of me. But yours, O oh God. Let me trust in you. Jesus is also announced at this point. This vocal, and it's in, in it's all, all the Gospels. It announces him to those present and to Israel you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. And it's slightly different. This is my beloved son, I think it says in, in Luke. Um, or John, I can't remember which one. 
Yoma. So it's declaring who he is. This is my beloved son. Last page. Jesus is demonstrating what his whole ministry is about. It's making it possible for sinners to repent in order to find forgiveness and a new life in God. He's showing us the way. He's making the way. This is what Donald English says. Not a, not a relative of Eddie, I don't think, but he wrote a great commentary on this book. He shares the circumstances where we become aware of our needs in order to meet those needs. You're aware of your needs and so you can meet other people's needs. That's what Jesus was doing. He was aware what he needed, what we needed to do. As so we look ahead after Jesus has been crucified and risen, and again we see Peter preach on the day of Pentecost. Let me, I'm going to read, I'm going to close with this, just reading from, from Acts chapter 2, verse 36. It said, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That's us. It's pointing at us, not just them. It's, we, would have been, we would have been there shouting, crucify him. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. But obviously we're not in a crooked generation anymore, are we? So those who received the word, his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. Jesus made a way in obedience, trusting him, his way, preparing his way, a way in the wilderness, in the desert, making the path straight. How's God going to work in your life unless you stop trusting other things and trust in him? It's really, I, I, you know, I'm preaching to myself as well. I've, you know, we trust in all sorts of things, don't we? And we but we, God wants us to fully trust in him. So in conclusion, and we, I think we've got time for a song. Pray, Graham's probably got half a dozen. As we come to this book of Mark, as we come to this passage, he wants us to know more about the real Jesus. He wants us to know who Jesus is and what he does. John prepares the way for him and Jesus prepares the way for us. And we need to prepare a way for him to come into our lives, but also into other people's lives. And finally, are you willing? Are you willing to submit? Are you willing to obey? Are you willing to trust in God completely? Are you willing to meet him in your wilderness? Or are you meeting him in the wilderness now? Is it a time where you feel, where is God? Where is my water? Where is my sustenance? Where is my joy? You need to meet God in that place. Knowing that actually only he can bring you those things. So let's stand. And I just, with those words of the gospel, repent. Repent and be baptized. If, you, if there's people among, among us who haven't been baptized, it's a command. Repent and be baptized. Turn around, change your thinking. Do we think everything went perfectly in Jesus' ministry? Do we think that? I don't, I'm not sure it did. He didn't sin, so we won't sin. We won't.
curse of audio people. Because they're fantastic. But actually, we, we need to trust God. We need to trust him. We need to believe that he's got a plan for you. Repent and be baptized. Obey. Find your limited place. Now, just don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't want to undermine anyone. My place is limited too. We have a limited place in God's great plan. We're not even a drop in the bucket. But he has got a plan for us and he wants to use us. So let's worship him. Let's go. If there's anyone who's, who's not given their life to Christ, has not repented, received forgiveness of sins, then I'm happy to pray with you this morning. Declare him your Lord. If you are in a desperate place, come. Let's pray for you. Amen.